Right, we're talking about increase the safety of individuals at risk of suicide. So, um, this is not so much about suicide itself, but this is more more about the individual. How we can help an individual that that is going or wants to commit suicide. And as counselors, this is something we we probably will get a lot to do with. Um, not necessarily someone that wants to commit suicide, but someone that actually mentions it. So, um, <coughs> the problem with suicide is um, they say that 90% of all people that lived ever, there was, was a time in your life that you thought of suicide. Um, so, I think it, I'm not going to make a, like a little survey in our group now, but um, of everyone in here, um, most of you or some of you will say that yes, there was a time when I thought like I didn't want to live anymore. Um, so, yeah. Of um, statistics say that the the largest part of the population that actually commits suicide and is successful with their first attempt on men. Mm -hmm. So, so women's first first attempt is normally not successful um, because women is more careful, while men go in and they just finish the job. Um, so, so that that's why the highest rate of successful suicides are amongst men. Um, the rate amongst teenagers, the highest amount of teenage deaths is also suicide um, higher than car accidents and things like that so that's um, so suicide is really an issue in our in our society um, I don't know if you guys have Netflix I don't have Netflix um, I don't know if I'm part of the the wise part of the community and if I'm part of the stingy part of the community or whatever but I don't have Netflix and on Netflix there's a series called 13 reasons I don't know if you know about 13 reasons um, about a person committed suicide and the story is about 13 different reasons why they did it. There is a book about it. Um, I think like sometimes I think like I must read the book. Sometimes I feel like oh, no, I'm not going to waste my time reading the book. Um, but 13 reasons is a bit of a problem amongst young people because it sort of makes suicide a bit it's more glorifying. like... Yeah, it's glorifying suicide. Um, where there's nothing glorifying nor nothing to glorify about suicide. So, so just be, be aware of that, that um, there is this 13 reasons thing going around in schools um, and apparently there's a 13 reasons season two coming out. So no one knows about that. Um, but I've read about it. I, don't, I, have ne I haven't seen it because I don't have Netflix and I'm not planning to get Netflix. Um, so, all right, so increase the safety of, of individuals at risk of suicide. So, uh, individual at risk of suicide. What is an individual at risk of suicide? We can go through all those things. How does he look? How does she look? What, what, what happens in their lives? So, the first thing is principles and practices of suicide intervention. So, principles and practices of suicide intervention. And I'm just going to switch off the light and see if it's better on the video. Um, and... Because the moment I switch this changes on the the video starts flashing because of the the light. So, um, can you just open that blind for us, please? Or uh, uh, Daniel, you you're close to the blind. Thank you. Just for more light in here. Um, okay. So, principles. Since most suicide cases are capable of resolution, and which is interesting, most suicide cases are capable of resolution. So most suicide cases can be can be stopped. Um, a basic guiding principle is to promote safety and support. Safety and support pending through assessment of the client situations and options of future help. So one of the reasons people commit suicide is because they lost hope. Um, you will most definitely if you if you talk to someone that's committing or that's thinking about suicide. It's the fact that they lost hope. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Um, I lost my best friend, so now I don't have any more friends. The school thing is more. Sometimes at schools, it's a bit of a trend. Um, if one friend commits suicide, then some uh, some of them follow the trend. Um, but uh, the main reason why people, especially adults, lose, especially men, lose um, uh, commit suicide is I don't have hope. I lost my job. It's been two or three years, I can't get a job. Um, also, you get sometimes older people who get um, forced to retire. 
uh, and suddenly their whole career was built around what they've been doing. Okay, They're sitting at home, dies. their partner dies, they're all alone. Um, that's also why you get, um, I think in the news the last few, there's been quite a few cases on the news of um, murder suicides, where they actually, husband and wife, they're old, they decide um, and they commit, uh, they do a murder suicide, one killed the other one and, and the other commit suicide mm -hmm. because of the fact of um, Ill yeah, one's terminally yeah. ill and we don't see the future um, yeah. for us together or we would like to pass away together, mm -hmm. especially if one's terminally ill. Um, we've been married for 60 <coughs> years or 53 years or whatever and I can't see my life without you so let's go together. That sort of thing happens also. Um, all counsellors, youth workers, youth leaders should have basic requirement. Um, you must have acquired training how to recognize, assess, and refer a person at risk of suicide. So we must have the basic knowledge. We must know how, what must we do. If someone comes to you and says, I want to commit suicide, it's like, what are you going to do? Like freak out and run away? <laughs> or are you going to say like, oh, don't do that. It's not a good idea. And they'll walk out there and they'll say, what a silly woman. Um, so, so what are we going to do? So we need training. and and. The, the problem with, with, with this also is, and that's why youth workers are in there, is sometimes the first point of call is the youth worker. Sometimes at churches, it's the youth leader in the church, or, you know, when they get to us, we professionals, we're in a professional building, they have to make an appointment. So this is sort of really serious stuff now when I start talking to the counselor. But those people on ground level also needs to be know what to do. Um, so that's why it's important everyone needs to have some sort of training in what to do. Right, because um, what do you do? Uh, who do you refer a person to? Um, who of you went to Hungry Jacks the last few few weeks? Any one of you? Any one of you? Hungry Jacks, okay, great. Um, Hungry Jacks, awesome idea they have at the moment. Um, we, we're having, when's are you okay dates? Somewhere in September? Oh, yeah. Like that, yeah. 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 So in September we have Are You Okay Day. Are You Okay Day where you ask people are you okay. Um, the focus there is on suicide. Um, I actually got a bunch of their cards. They're actually in my, in my room. Um, you know those uh, where I have the plan mm -hmm. pamphlets? There's little yellow cards which says are you okay. And it actually on the one side explains to you what you do. How do you talk to a person about suicide. And on the other side there's a lot of helpline telephone numbers. Um, which is now available at All Hungry Jacks for this, this month, which is wow. amazing. Um, you know, if you go to Hungry Jacks, grab a few, um, grab a dollar, packet of chips and, and a few cards or something like that. But it's, it's just a good in, in, um, initiative from them. And on it is actually numbers, suicide numbers, child line, helpline numbers, um, which people can actually phone. So it's good to, to have those sort of numbers, even have one in your wallet that if you actually get into a situation that you can actually say, phone these people, that sort of, okay. So, um, so that's great to know about it. Any person working with high risk populations or suicidal clients need to have training, experience and supervision relevant to their role and responsibility. Supervision is important. Because you work with these high risk, it's, it's talking about high risk populations and suicidal. Um, those things take a lot of your energy, especially high risk people, they drain you because you need to keep on thinking on your feet. If a person's in a mental health thing and they've got um, schizophrenia and they are suicidal, aren't they supposed to watch them all the time? Some people need to, to be watched. Uh, some people, I know, I know situations where people are on a 24-hour suicidal watch. Um, I don't know, it, it's a sort of the people uh, over them that probably makes these calls. Um, I had a person, um, I had one of my church members um, who was, he had schizophrenia where he had voices. And one morning um, he was sitting next to his wife, amazing people out really him and his wife. you won't know there's anything wrong it's not no. like I, I think we have a bit of a misconception about people that have schizophrenia 
you know, um, <coughs> I think what we see in movies and stuff is not really what, what it is. The, the highly functioning, um, yeah. this guy was functioning, he was working, um, he was actually, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, um, it, it's a bowman. He actually, he was one of these people who can tell you where's water. Like the diviner. The diviner. A diviner, yes. yeah, 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 that. So he can actually tell you where's water and then they draw there for water, that sort of stuff. So that's what he did. And the morning they woke up and his wife said to him, are you going to go to work? And he said to her, I oh, no, um, I didn't have a good night. And as he was sitting next to her and she was still sleeping, suddenly there was just a, a gun went off. And he shot himself. And, and I spoke to the wife later that day and, and she said to me that um, I'm sure that they told him. Because she, she referred to the voices as they. So she said, I'm sure they told him. Because the, the bullet went off, she said to him, what are you doing? And he said to her, I'm just looking, I'm just, I'm just trying something. And then he fell back and he died. Um, and, and she said, like, they probably told him that, um, to do it. So, so these voices um, play, play roles. And, um, but he was obviously not such a high risk because he was working normally and then suddenly this just happens. Um, but there are people. There are people who are on twenty-four hours who are sort of watch. And, and if they're not, I mean, if they're in the, a psych ward, wouldn't any where they can get out? Shouldn't that be locked so they can't get to the top of the roof? I assume it would be. Yeah, you can't. I, I assume mean, it in, would be. In uh, psychiatric facilities, it's very hard to yeah. to not leave not. a room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also certain rooms, like we know the padded rooms and the. Where there's nothing that they can hurt themselves and mm -hmm. no blankets and stuff like that which they can use so there's lots of lots of stuff but um the bi the basics is that if you in your in your practice or um if you're a youth worker or a case worker or a case manager or or a social worker or whatever you you do need support you can't just work with these people without having no. having support you need to to have support um all right just <coughs> We're talking about suicide, and I say we, we need to try and change the way we, we talk about it. Um, there's sort of a stigma towards the way we talk about it. Um, and they've got like, they come up with a list of possible ways to better the wording. Um, so the, the stigmatized one is he committed suicide, they say he died by suicide. Um, don't really know, personally, don't really know what. It's appropriate terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Um, successful suicide or he suicided, completed suicide instead of ended his or her life, took his or her own life, failed attempt at suicide, non-fatal attempt at suicide, an unsuccessful suicide attempt to end his or her life. So if it's, um, there was an attempt, attempt, but obviously he didn't succeed, so attempts, so like attempted murder, that sort of stuff. So it's like talking about differently about it and uh, and the other thing is it's interesting about society and especially kids too is um, we love to talk about it oh I'll just kill myself mm -hmm. yeah? the thing is with young people I don't know if this is what um, I was told with young people and with adults young people have a very different idea of death yeah they think that they will actually see themselves and see people at their funeral and <coughs> yeah. like they see it differently to, to the way yeah. adults do. Yeah. And which is harder to try and explain to them about it. Yeah. Because yeah. they also see it via the movies. Mm. And they're living in this this world with, with, with a movie world, a movie what's happening in the movies. Um, but also we um, our brains are um, very interesting things and our brain form pathways so it's like grooves like grooves in the road and if you start speaking negative about yourself or about life you are creating almost like a groove like a pathway mm -hmm. um, which becomes a fallback so when you are negative like I'm saying, like, like you do something wrong. It's like you write, write a letter, which we all do. We write something, you write the wrong date. 
the first reaction is, oh, you're stupid. Most people do that. We don't go like, oh, I made a mistake. We like, oh, you're stupid. We, we speak this bad stuff about ourselves. That's so, people who are very negative. Yeah, but in general, so. just just look around you. Look around you. We all do it. Or most people do that. Yeah, and, I and, and, like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you say yeah. stuff like that. And, oh, okay, but it's yeah. something you keep on saying. Those are pathways you're yeah. creating in your brain. Okay? So you're like, you're like, your brain's getting a groove which is negative. So every time you do something wrong, it, its fallback is, oh, you stupid idiot. Oh, you stupid. Oh, you. Where, where, if you, if you reprogram it, you can grow better grooves. It's, it's all a bit, a bit of brain psychology stuff happening, um, brain plasticity thing yeah. happening. So it's to reprogram it. The other thing which, which a lot of people do, especially I find out amongst young people, is that when something goes gr gr not so nice in their life, the first option in a joke is like, oh, I'll just kill myself. It's like, you know, if, if I get home and my dad is so angry, I, was like, I can just kill myself. Or if, you know, if I fail this test, they're starting to form this pathway, this fallback. And then it's like, it sort of becomes like normal. If something goes wrong, this is my option. Um, so, so that is why it's important uh, how we speak, mm -hmm. um, because of brain, our brain plasticity and our brain, the way our brain works and the brain forms its pathways, is like you're forming these grooves, um, and um, we need to be careful how we speak, and that's another thing that you need to teach your client is positive affirmations, and I'm not saying these like positive stuff like, you know. Um, everything will be okay and everything will be no. fine and that sort of stuff but I'm talking about this stuff like positive stuff about you mm. you know it's like there's this amazing amazing song of Robbie Williams at the moment and it's like mm. when I get that song it's like it's in my brain the whole day it's like I'm wonderful I'm powerful I'm it's just a great song and I, I actually thought it's a Christian song and then I, uh, I heard it actually Robbie Williams and he wrote it for his daughter Mm. And, and it's yeah, such a good it. song. It's like I'm wonderful. I'm I am powerful. I'm you know. It's like it's like it's such a good thing. And it, it does it's these positive words that you just keep on yeah. repeating uh, instead of the negative. Instead of uh, you know, it's like. But Gilbert has his drawing in it too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I was just gonna say when um, um, I was a family support worker and I worked with the young mums, we were. Um, we always used positive affirmations, positive mm -hmm. way of talk and, and yeah. programs and all that sort of stuff to try and get them to yeah. rechange re their yeah. re way of thinking. Re yeah, you retrain mm -hmm. the way you think. Um, because we do that a lot to our kids too, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We'll say bad things about our kids, saying like, I don't think you're going to make it, my child. But the other thing when you said the positive talking with them would be basically reinforcing their strengths. Yeah. Then? <coughs> reinforcing. Look, you said this, and that's a real strength. Yeah. 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 And also, also a, a child's ability or a child, like if a child has um, certain issues, let's say ADHD or whatever, that the f issue or mental issue or whatever does not define the person. No, no. Same story with exactly. sexuality. Your sexuality does not define no. you. No. It's not my ADHD kid. It's a label. It's my that oldest kid. It's, it's, that it's my son. Use them as labels. Yeah, so, so don't label your kid by saying mm. my this kid, my that kid. It's yeah. like, he's my oldest son, he's my youngest son. This is my, you know, mm. that sort of stuff. Um, I'm trying to, but on a daily basis, Sometimes during the day, when my kids will post me, I'll say, I love you. Um, this is something that I'm trying. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and they like, sometimes I get a response, mm -hmm. sometimes I get no response. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes yeah. I think they think, Oh, you're such weird. Dad, yeah. you are weird. Yeah. But, or you get, mm. but there's, mm. there's get nothing right. greater than a child to just know that. My parent loves me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And for a parent to say that, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the greatest memories of my dad, my dad had Alzheimer's. The last time I physically spoke to my dad was two years before he passed away mm -hmm. because then suddenly it wasn't possible for me to speak to him anymore because he had no clue 
well, he couldn't even properly operate a phone. But in that conversation, he actually said to me, I love you. And that is the best conversation I ever had with my dad. Because in that conversation, he said that. So, so and a lot of people want acceptance. A lot of people want love. There's a search for love. There's a search for acceptance. Um, that's why kids hang out with their own crowds, because they accept them. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's about acceptance. So even with suicide, is people lose, uh, lose hope because there's no one to support them. There's no one around them. So we need to try and work on support networks and that sort of stuff. So working with young people is a relational practice. I, I did put in young people specifically, but working with all people is relational. Mm -hmm. But especially young people. If you want to focus your practice on young people, is you need to be able to build relationships. You really need to build relationship. Um, and that's why um, I've told you before that I believe in having a counselor um, for me and my family. Um, there's nothing wrong, but we need to see a counselor. Do you go as a family group or individual? Um, we're going to go now as a family, but um, I find a family counselor actually now, but um, otherwise individual or so yesterday I had my first appointment with this person. Amazing. A few minutes there, the rapport was there. You know, this person actually just, it's a, it's a lady and she's like, spot on. She hear what I'm saying, she's like that. And it's like, great, you know? Because why I say people need counselors? Because we need counselors before we have an issue. You get this person every once, in, even once a month, you go and see your counselor. When you get an issue, it's no issue to go and see them because you know them. You have rapport. You can just chat to them about everyday things. So, so go and see, go and find a good counselor, and go and see this person on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Just go and see someone. Um, relationships with Australia are great. If you're a student, they've got great <coughs> rates, like thirty-five dollars an hour. Um, Christian Heritage College have a. Have a Great training facility there in Mansfield, twenty dollars an hour. Um, just go and see someone, right? Just. Um, and unfortunately, with this course, is we can't get rid of a lot of stuff. Where when I did the CHC one, I had to do fifty hours of counselling. I had to go for fifty hours of counselling. So you get rid of a lot of stuff. Um, so, but get get a counsellor, get someone that you normally talk to, and then when you start actually practicing. It's no issue because you've got this person, you've got rapport with them, you can just continue them. And maybe you become such great friends that you join in their practice. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so, but, but work with people, okay? Um, so that's why I say uh, with the client and the counselor, youth worker, mentor work together in a collaborative manner. So, you and your client, you and your, especially a young person, you build rapport and you work together. Uh, and that's the, that's the key is we work together. We're not going to stand there and say to them, you do this and you do that. We work together. We're a team. Okay? We journey together. Um, Chris, Christian terms is we pilgrim together. We pil we're on a pilgrimage together. Um, I walk with you. I walk one step beside you, one step behind you. I'm not walking ahead of you. So that's what's needed. Workers have to be guided by duty of care. This is the lovely thing called duty of care and <coughs> this is also the nightmare for all of us. Duty of care is a legal obligation which is imposed on an individual requiring adherence to a standard of reasonable care while performing uh, any act that could foreseeably harm others. It is the first element that must be established to proceed with an action in negligence. So this lady says, I'm a very competent worker. I pride myself in my duty of care while the person is in the bath halfway drowning. Um, so, so she would be guilty of some sort of negligence. So duty of care is, and just make sure that you, you are, and that's why it's important for, to have good notes, really good notes. That's why it's important that you also speak to your supervisor. And when I say supervisor, is there's two types of supervisors. Okay, so if you work at a let's say you let's say Relationships Australia, you work for them, 
Um, you have obviously have a supervisor there, a person who is sort of the boss person there. Um, it obviously, if something like this happens, person talks about suicide. I'm not really securing this thing. I speak to that person. But also, if I'm not sure, I also go to my clinical supervisor, who I actually pay, who is an external person, um, who sees things then from a different point of view. So um, there's different sort of ways. Also, uh, another way is like if you're in a com organization where are many counselors, you also have peer reviews or uh, peer meetings where you discuss cases together. Um, we um, there's two sorts of supervision sessions. The one session is a one-on-one -on -one with your supervisor, and then the other one is a group supervision session. So maximum people in a group session is six. So six counselors get together with a supervisor and they discuss cases, which is quite cool, because then you get a lot of input in this, and it's cheaper, <laughs> because they don't charge the one-on-one -on -one price. It's actually a much cheaper, cheaper price for you. So you can work out what works for you. Right, so that's duty of care. Make sure that you are actually aware of duty of care. Um, general principles of assessment when you have a client that um, is suicidal, general things in initiate a therapeutic relationship by demonstrating acceptance of the person. Make sure the person feels accepted. Um, one of the great issues of people is we, we feel rejected, we feel not accepted, we don't feel loved, and we don't have hope. Walk into your room and you feel accepted. Say nice stuff to the person. Okay, sometimes some, some clients walk in, into your room and they look really, really, really terrible. You know, um, they, sometimes they scare you with all their tattoos and all their piercings and whatever. But find something nice to say. Like, oh, that's a nice earring. Or something like that. The seventh one from the top. That sort of stuff. But, but be, make sure the person feels accepted. Okay, make sure the person feels loved. But then... Um, Engender hope when possible. Make sure you speak hope. Make sure you talk about hope. Like if they tell you something like, oh, it's a, like I think the guy in China is going to drop a bomb and explode and blow us all away. It's like, please don't say that. Oh, yeah, I think the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, then say, rather say something like, um, not one of his bombs worked at this stage. So it's like, fine, you know. Just find something positive and try and just be bring hope. Then also explore the meaning of self-harm for the person. So this person self-harms, why do you self-harm? But please don't go around and say, why do you self-harm? Like, be, be general. So, so, so when you self-harm, what's happening for you? You know, when you cut yourself or when you, what's happening for you? Why? Tell me what you're feeling, what you're experiencing. But be very nice and gentle. Be like really loving. So it's mainly about how that would be feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it's about how you are feeling. It's like trying to get them to tell you how they're feeling without judging them. Without saying to them, oh, that's so wrong. It's like, you know. It's like when they cut themselves, it's. Um, they, they will endure the pain rather than the pain that's going on in their head. It's release. Yeah. It's about release. You know, it's about release. It's about. So that's how they find release for issues. Clarify current difficulties and what's your, what's your problem? It's like my boyfriend just left me, I, I, I lost my job, I don't have a place to stay, whatever. Clarify the difficulties, what they're going through now. Um, because that difficulties play a role in their decision, suicidal decisions and stuff like that. Observe their mental state, verbal, non-verbal. So how, how do you, what do you think about their mental state? Um, Is that doing a mental health? You can do a mental health um, plan. plan thing. Yeah. Uh, a, thing. Not a plan thing, uh, you know, the questionnaire yeah. thing, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the mental health, yes. Yeah. So yeah. you're probably where you will be, there'll be probably standard ones that you okay. pull out. Um, normally, when before a client actually comes in, uh, most places will have a bit of a questionnaire that they fill out. Um, if it's on relationships, it's like on one to ten, how happy are you with your relationship with this person? Um, how you, um, one to ten, do you see yourself ten years from now still with this person? That sort of stuff, um, and then also personal stuff like um, how do you feel about yourself? One to ten, um, did you ever self harm? Do you have feelings of hopelessness? Feelings of so that sort of stuff normally in a, in a questionnaire when you and your intake questionnaire before before 
and you'll get this then and you will read this and, and according to that you'll know like oh this guy's got a zero for hope he's got no hope so we need to work on that so and that would go with the drugs and alcohol that will go with drugs and alcohol anything like that yeah just make sure that the person is not not full of drugs and alcohol when you do this because then your assessment will be really out of whack mm. okay because it's really because obviously you can't really assess a person when they are not really by the full positive um, in, in your room. So rather make sure they are actually, uh, and we need to go back one. Right, um, psychological assessments. So this is part of the assessment. So when you're doing assessment on someone, first of all, um, the following type of questions need to be in your assessment. Social and family circumstances. Which is one of the, the first reasons is what are your circumstances? Family, social life, um, are you, do you have friends? Do you, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting if we look at people like um, guys that go and, and start shooting at a school. Um, their social ex circumstances, their, their home circumstances. Um, look at those, those sort of things happening. There's, there's stuff. So first thing is, tell me about your life. Tell me about who you are. Tell me about how's your house home life, tell me about how school or college or, you know, like, how's work. So you try and figure it out. Um, if they said that you're saying that I hate my work, I, I would like to kill everyone at work, it's like, whoa, okay, okay make a, make a nice, nice big note, like, here's something wrong, yeah. Um, but some people, when you talk to them, you realize that there's no real issue. You know, it's like, but sometimes you will realize, and, and the more you, you, you work with people, the more you realize when and what is going on. Right, then um, significant relationships that might be supportive or might represent a threat. So, how's your relationships? Um, how's your relationship with mom and, dad, mom and dad? Great. How's your relationship with your girlfriend? Oh, we broke up last week. Okay, that might be a threat. How long have you been in a relationship? Five years. Uh, okay, that's a long time. So he, here's some stuff happening. He's, so we need to explore. So there's a lot of exploration happening. It needs to be done there. A history of mental health difficulties. Have you ever had depression, anxiety? Normally in your intake form, there'll be uh, stuff like, have you seen a psychologist? Have you seen a counselor? Have you been on medication? Have you, seen, you know, all those things are normally on the intake form, which will give you an idea. Sometimes they'll say, I can't remember what pills I used because it was five years or ten years ago, that's fine. You just, oh, you don't need to know exactly what they used, it's just, you know that there was an issue, but obviously after five years it's not really um, much of an issue yet left, so maybe something new triggered something. Um, current mental health difficulties, I went through that. Use of drugs and alcohol. Um, some of them, because it's a confidential thing, and um, they can, you can ask them to tell you what drugs they actually use. Um, because that can play a role. Can you just say, you know, it's confidential, yeah. so I won't say It's confidential. I just need to know what drugs you use because I, that's where I can help you the best of my ability. Um, and then go and do a bit of a study what can actually happen if they use that specific drugs. Um, like as you said, sometimes it can be over the counter drugs too. It doesn't necessarily have to yeah. be any street drugs. It can be any drugs or coffee. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we don't call it drugs, but yes, um, some people are really addicted to coffee. Um, so <coughs> there's lots of drugs available. Um, mothers, how many mothers have you drank today? Um, so okay, so use of drugs and alcohol, past suicidal intent of cell phone <coughs> methods, frequency. How many times do you cell phone? Would most people like, if they've tried it a couple of times, use the same method or different methods? Like if they said, oh yeah, I've done it once before. Suicide? Twice. Yeah, with suicide. Would they change? Would people that have tried, would it be the same method they'd try again or different methods? I don't, think it does, I don't think it doesn't. I was just curious if some people might yeah. just do it the same way or... <coughs> I don't know. It depends on what they have yeah. available. Yeah, it was percentage. Yeah. That they I knew someone who tried drowning herself in the bath several times and then that didn't work. She tried sticking her head in the oven and that didn't work. She eventually had herself. So, so, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. so, you know, yeah, it depends. I, th I think it's what's available and it's opportunistic. Because yeah. it's usually impulsive, yeah. isn't it? What's yeah. available? Yeah. Not, not, not always. Yeah. Sometimes it's really yeah. planned. Really well planned. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We know 
when the parents go away, when everyone, when there's no one in the house, that sort of stuff. Um, I know a situation of a guy that was on 24 hours suicidal. He, he tried to commit suicide. He drove, he jumped off a bridge. Um, that failed, but he was in hospital about two or three, three, three years ago. You know, he actually stayed in hospital about three years of recovering after jumping off a bridge. That's that's an issue that happened in New Zealand. And um, what happened was he was on basically 24 hour suicide watch by his parents um, for about two years. This one day they moved, they, they went out to do something, and he, he, the mom spoke to him earlier today and said to him, how are you doing? He said, I'm fine, I took a walk to the shop, um, through the park, um, I got myself some cool drink, whatever, I'm back now. When she came home, he wasn't there. They found him, he hung himself in the park. So um, after being watched for two years constantly, the one time that they didn't watch him was the day he did it. I remember they said it by saying, I paid for a walk through the park. Yeah, yeah. Which sounds quite great. I mean, he went for a walk, he mm. bought something at the shop. Um, what he actually bought at the shop was rope. So, um, yeah, so, so some people are really just really 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 determined, um, determined. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah there's nothing you can do to stop them when they're that determined. nothing you can do to stop them sometimes they would um especially the the counselors psychologists they would actually um play a game with you and be careful that they don't do that that you don't fall in the games what he did with his psychologist was that saying that um i am going to um, commit suicide in five minutes unless you yeah which is barely impossible for a person to make sure that you get to this place in five minutes. You can call the police, obviously, yeah. and say that, yeah. but, but that doesn't really, didn't really help because he wasn't at home, he wasn't in the park. Yes. Um, but, um, so just be careful that sometimes your client plays games and that when they play this game... So what, what do you do when they do that? Do you just ignore that or do you I would, act on it? I would call the police. Okay. okay. I would call the police. I've I've done that before. Um, I had a client who, who self harmed, but on um, self harmed extreme bad. Um, she self harmed like blood everywhere, that sort of stuff. Won't find you. No, 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 no. I would, normally her partner would call me and say that the house is full of blood and because she would cut herself. It looked like a corrugated eye in her arms. I've never seen such bad arms. Um, but every time they phoned me, I didn't go out because. First of all, you don't. I don't want that that total involvement. Mm -hmm. So I phone phone the ambulance. Yeah. Keep on phoning the ambulance. Um, that it helped in a way because the ambulance um, she didn't like that. Yeah. Um, but every time they came, she actually had to get stitches. That's how deep she cut. They gave us they had to get stitches. Did she have a mental health team see her? Um. Yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. The mental health. Lots of suicidal talks. Because isn't there a number you can call for the, when I did the community service, we could also call if we had a suicide, there's the mental health. Yeah, this this was in South Africa, so this is oh. not here, so, so it, it's, it's, different. A, it's a different system and this person was under state um, medical, which is very slack actually, but um, yeah, the best was phone the ambulance, ambulance yeah. phone police, phone ambulance, that's it. Um, so I've got a client, client said she's, the client lives here, said she's going to commit suicide in five minutes, I can't be there. I mean, even if you... You're not Superman. You're not Superman, and also you can't take that responsibility. Yeah. Because if you take responsibility for one client that didn't make it... Mm -hmm. That's yeah. becoming too personal. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, our work as counsellors are not to save people. Our work is to give them an environment where they can grow. Okay. Also, when you do marriage and relationship counselling, we are not here to save the marriage, we are not here to save the relationship, we are providing a space, a safe space where they can grow. Okay? So that's it. So when you've got a client that like, commits suicide, it's not personal. Okay? It's not personal. That will happen. And we can't just save them all. We're self harm. And they are seeing psychologists, psychiatrists, and that, but they still constantly are so doing the same thing. Will they ever get out of that situation? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. 
Um, and sometimes I accidentally kill themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah so, so it's like some, yeah. sometimes you get success, right? Mm. There are successful stories. Um, one of the best ways would be to actually find out, and this is where you actually really have to build a good rapport, is to find out exactly what they experience, what they feel, and if there's something that you can do to replace that feeling. What can they do when they're feeling this way? Yeah, so, to, so let's say you get a feeling of release. What else can you do to get that feeling of release? Mm. So that's Final alternative. Yeah, so find an alternative. You cannot, with a client, say don't do it, take it away, stop it. No. You need to give them an alternative. Same mm -hmm. with pornography, same with gambling. You can't just say stop it. You go and you find out what, what do you experience when you watch the pornography? Or what do you, what, what's happening in you when you gamble? And you need to find something that gives them that same sort of hype. Or the gaming. Day. Yeah, same yeah, thing. same thing. Yeah, so 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 with this also is what can you do to replace that? So I still get the same feeling. So, but what would you find in those instances? That's, like, that's would be difficult. That's between you. That's between yes. you and your client. So that's yeah. where you you and your client are going to explore. Yeah, mm. you're going to explore. You're going to talk about that. Right. And so, a lot of it goes back to. What's been going on in their life? What's been going on in their life? Yeah. What's happening in their life? What What are they experiencing? What's going on? Yeah. Okay. And when so this happens, what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A psychological assessment. We continue with that. You should include assessment needs of risks. Um, you, do, do you have a current desire to die? Ask these questions. Do you have a current? Sorry. It's in. It's in. It's all in there. But you can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Do uh, you have a current desire to die? Ask him the question. Current suicidal ideas. What do you want to? If you're going to commit suicide, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? Like um, some people come up with the strangest, strangest ideas. I mean, one of our um, one of our students the other day, um, one, uh, one of our students, she she was at graduation. She graduated, and. Um, Two or three weeks ago, she committed suicide mm -hmm. by overdosing on insulin. She was a diabetic, and she just overdosed on that. There's nothing you do to bring back from that. Either. Yeah. So it's so suicidal ideas. What sort of ideas? <coughs> What's your plan? <coughs> if you want to commit suicide? What is your plan? <coughs> uh, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do whatever. Okay. Your intent. Access to means to end their life. So if you say, let's say the person says, I want to use poison, do they have access to poison? Um, coping mechanism and strengths, things that the person has used successfully in the past to cope with difficult situations. So what's your coping mechanism? What's your strength? So if you feel like this, if you feel like you want to die, what makes you cope? What's your happy place? What's your, what can you do? Who can you phone? So you, you need to ask these questions to realize what's happening in their minds. Okay. When increasing safety to a person at risk of suicide, it is important that you do not increase the risk to yourself or others. Be careful not to place yourself in danger. Okay. If the person is standing on a high building and wants to jump, don't climb out next to them. Because they might even pull you down with them. Okay? Be careful. Do not increase your risk. Identify safety actions. Implement safety plans. When talking to a suicidal person, focus on things that will keep them safe for now rather than the things that will put them at risk. To help keep the suicidal person safe, develop a safety plan. Develop a plan. How are we going to keep you safe? How are we going to help you? How are we going to... And sometimes these things sound like really like it's not going to work. Um, if the person wants to do it, they're going to do it. Because, we you know, we've got that no harm contract, uh, which they sign you. But what did they lose if they actually don't break yeah, the contract? Nothing. <laughs> but, but for some it's reason, it helps. Mm. Safety plan should focus on what the suicidal person should do rather than what they should not do. So when you feel like this, what should you do? Okay, 
phone this person or phone this one or do this okay be clear outline what will be done who will be doing it and when will it be carried out so be clear in your safety plan like when you call someone what are they going to do they're going to come over to your house or you're going to go to their house that sort of thing uh, before be for a length of time which will be easier for the suicidal person to cope with so that they can feel able to fulfill the agreement and have a sense of achievement what will make them happy so they need to feel that they've achieved something like I wanted to commit suicide I phoned John John came to my house we went out for a milkshake I feel so much better I've achieved this because the plan is working include contact numbers that the person agrees to call when they feel suicidal um, and please don't, don't put your number in there okay because you don't want your clients to, to become reliable relying on you they are suicidal persons or, or they are suicidal helplines yes. and all those things out there so let them phone the plan you are not there to save them you are there to help them guide them you're the counselor um, so if they have youth leaders which they can phone or uh, youth pastors or they people that they can phone 24 hours of the day okay so they get them num get their numbers in there um, uh, family members uh, crisis line so um, when you're done take one of those cards with all the numbers and keep it with you um, that you can have if you get to the situation safety plan include identify the signs relevant to the young person that may include when an episode of self-harm is more likely so when an episode is more likely when what will what's the triggers for self-harm what makes you feel like you want to self-harm or cut yourself what what happens what's it attempt to reduce prevent and avoid risk conditions so your risk condition is I if I go to John's house and John's brother is a bully then I feel like I want to self-harm myself so risk is don't go to John's house avoid his house something like that provide the person with alternate strategies if they feel they may not be safe alternative uh, I, I don't feel safe I think I'm gonna hurt myself today make sure but what can you do okay go to Mary's house go to Mo go to granny's house go to whatever work out a plan go to Eagle Bee Learning Center in the shopping yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. of it is people, right? Yeah. 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 What's this? This Eagle Bee, Eagle Bee, this Wesley Mission yeah. place here in uh, Eagle Bee. Yeah. Like, yeah, like right, a, right. Yeah. yeah, that sort of place. Go to those places. They're open. PCYC. You can also even, um, you can even direct them to the emergency centre at the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Or go, um, yeah. Some, some kids are into sport, go to gym. Like I feel like I'm going to hurt myself, I'd rather quickly go to gym, get a workout, spend some time, positive yeah, stuff, yeah. yeah, that sort of stuff, work out a safety plan, right, um, access how the person can be supported through the event, okay, so you feel like who can support you, um, you know, in case of emergency, who are the people around you, um, hospitals, you can even go to hospitals, the pr only problem is there's so many people waiting yeah. at the hospital. It takes you hours, yeah. I mean. Oh, I think, um, yeah. <coughs> I don't want to say, but being in an experience where you've taken someone, um, it's more or less you take them, tell them what's going on, and it will bam in. Okay, so they... they so that was like just straight in. Yeah, yeah. No hesitation. Okay. When I had a panic attack one day, I went straight in. So, so yeah. it's obviously according to what the issue yeah, is. Okay. is so the obviously how, how, how serious the issue is. Yeah. Consider for, forming a care team. Okay, you've got a care team, people that monitor the, the person. So friends monitor the person you can trust actually, friends that you can trust. Uh, parents, other people, teachers, there's a whole care team uh, involved in the process. Uh, a teacher that what, they've got a close relationship with at school or even at work, like there's a colleague at work, if you work somewhere and you've got issues, there's someone at work that you trust. Uh, can I just ask, yeah. when it's um, like a young person and they don't have that support network within the family home, how that, that would be really hard for them to find yeah. like, yeah. So, like that support mm. and then find 
a good solution, a good outcome. Yeah, it's quite difficult for yeah, them. Yeah, would be. Yeah. Because for, for many young people, unfortunately, the problem is actually because of the home. Mm, mm. You know, because of home life, because mm. there's nothing, there's no support, there's just everything that's wrong is actually from home. Mm. And that's why we, you as a counselor, need to connect them. Yeah. So be aware of all the, the people in the area, your, your, all your organisations, your with the missions and oh, your, your okay, PCYCs yeah. and your, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, if they're in school, it's even easier at school because, yeah. um, you know, there's more help at school. Yeah. Um, if they're over 16, it's a bit more difficult. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. 16 is the cut-off age. Um, so, but, but we can still connect them. Yeah, yeah. And also there are great churches in the areas. If you can also find out there are church groups, young young groups, which is also quite good, yeah. uh -huh. that can actually support, even if the kid's not even a Christian, mm -hmm. you know, they'll support the kid um, in, in, in mental health issues. Um, there's, there's many, many places available for that, but even have counsellors, okay. um, free counsellors available. Consult with other professionals who may already be involved and have expertise to offer in supporting the person. So if you don't know, speak to your colleagues, speak to other counselors, you know, what must we do um, with this person. Um, encourage the person to get appropriate professional help as soon as possible. So if you feel down, you feel I'm not gonna do this, I feel I'm not gonna get through this, get help. Um, there's some of the acts, the Work Health and Safety yeah. Act, Child Protection Act, the Mental Health Act, we need to take them into consideration. Sure. Queensland we have, and funny enough, our Queensland Act is the oldest. Queensland Act of 2000. All the other acts are more up to date. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So, so there's, there's the website address for the Queensland Health Act. Yeah. Right, you can support clients by providing as much information as possible, encouraging them to reach a decision. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? How are we going to help you? Okay, I don't know. Okay, so if you feel like this, what? Help them to get to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Emphasize that they have reached a decision and how they need to act on it. Affirm their ability to make decisions and develop steps to reach their goals. Right, so, um, and the goal of suicide is not a goal. <laughs> okay, so everything apart from that. Um, Peter Janetsky um, says, <laughs> he says suicide is a solution to a problem, but it's a sucky solution. Mm -hmm. So um, we try and get better solutions. We help our clients to get better, better solutions than that. And we do that via suicide, okay? Um, there are some barriers, stigma, we fear that we've been mistreated, uh, no access to appropriate support culturally, special culture. Some cultures look down on someone that wants to commit suicide. Um, so yes, I come from a culture where that is a bit of an issue. Um, and then internalized stigma, and talk, you know, and um, talking on helplessness and the patient role, right? So um, sometimes they really feel helpless. And you need to try and empower them and also tell them what's your role in this process. Um, what's your role in the treatment? What's your role in how we're going to help? your responsibility um, but the main thing is you know, need to show them hope you need to show that there's hope for them and they're not alone and they're worth it worth and they're worth it they're worth it now, I'm, I'm willing to spend time I'm willing to spend time on you I'm willing to mm. you know give you attention I'm willing to introduce you to other people who would spend time in it with you so there's there's lots of work that we need to do Self-care, obviously, as I said earlier, it's very, very important that we have self-care, especially if you work with these type of clients. Um, so, clinical supervisor, some self-soothing, you know, go to your happy place, do the stuff that you enjoy, to switch off, relax, and reflection, self-reflection. Yeah. I was just one back on the other screen when you had the act, and I noticed the um, child protection, would there be a time that you, how do you think, would that be something you use? Would you have to bring them at any stage? It depends. It depends on the situation, obviously. Uh, and it also depends on the, act, on, on the age. Mm -hmm. um, because normally, but there could be cases. 
They would be kind. Yeah. yeah, they would be kind. I mean, I'm talking about that. They would be kind. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, if, if there's stuff happening at home which causes kid to mm -hmm. commit suicide, and, and that's when you get home. You know, job. and like, yes, there's, there's, I mean, small, there, there might be reasons mm -hmm. why the kid wants to commit suicide, apart from being feeling helpless and hopeless and. And, and not good enough. So, and, and you so can remove him from that situation. You can remove him from the situation. That so that's where you, and in schools, that's like where you have your teams and you've got your snap referrals and, and you've got all those. those so, yeah, it's happening at school together. and then you go to the school. Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously, it will come in place sometime. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I say, the, the only issue is if the kid is very close to turning 16 or 16, um, nothing's really going to happen. Yeah, that's right. Because they have such a high load, a high volume of, of cases in your. So there's nothing wrong with them, it's just the fact that they have high loads. And once a kid turns 16, they can't. I mean, I know of a case we took a kid away from their the parents uh, due to a lot of stuff happening. Uh, he was 15, when he turned 16, he said, I'm gonna go back. So all the hard work and all the, the paperwork and everything was just null and void because he wanted to go back. And then you can't do anything about it. So yeah. So that is it, um, in a bit of a nutshell, um, increase the safety of individuals at risk. Um, so yeah, that's why I have found this book for you, go and enjoy the book, read it, keep it as a reference, you might need it.